Welcome to The Drawing Board. I am your host and in-house artist, Aaron Leffler. If you're not familiar with The Drawing Board, here's a quick recap what happens on the show. Every episode of The Drawing Board, I invite a guest from the comics and entertainment industry, and we learn a bit more about what they do. And while we learn about what they do, I'm also drawing them. Pretty fun, right? Well, I'm super excited to introduce y'all to my guest this week because my guest started out in one career and it ended up turning into something completely different. He went from football and is now in music and quite frankly, his music is just incredible and I can't wait for y'all to meet him. Please welcome my guest, Joe Barksdale. Hi there. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for coming on. Now, for question. kids who aren't familiar with what you do or what you previously did, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do? Sure. I, um, I, as of last year, I retired from an uh, eight-year NFL career, and now I am a professional musician, singer, songwriter, and producer, and guitar player. I said musician already, <laughs> so I'm also a uh, professional double stater, so there you go. <laughs> I love it! Now, that, that's a lot of different roles. How, how did you get into these things? Um, the football I got into when I was... 16. I um, Before that, my deal was engineering. I wanted to design cars or phones or tech. I wanted to be involved with design. Um, I got kicked out of an engineering camp. Um, brief side note, I recently was diagnosed with Asperger's. Um, and to make a long story short, you know, not knowing, um, so not being able to take social cues got me kicked out of an engineering camp, a very prestigious engineering camp. Um, back when I was 15 or 16, I needed something to do over the summer. So I started playing football to get in shape, um, which led to me getting, um, you know, becoming a Parade All-American and, you know, having my choice of where I wanted to go to school. Uh, I chose LSU, went from LSU to the NFL. And um, around, I would say, around the halfway mark of my NFL career, um, I had a very significant death in my life, and I picked up, I was suggested, uh, or I was advised by my coach to look for an outlet, um, and I found a guitar, and um, a few years later, I got good enough at it that I felt that I could be a professional, and, you know, I found out that I could also sing, so I started singing and writing songs, um, and during COVID, um, I was actually supposed to be like, you know, getting things going as far as um, starting to take regional tours and stuff like that this year. But because of, um, you know, because of everything that's happened, I had a lot of time at home to, you know, hone my skills. And that's how I got into production. So I am now a producer, singer, songwriting, um, guitar playing, former NFL player. <laughs> That is incredible. Now, I have to ask, because you just brought out one of my favorite points I love talking about. You said that this started out as a different way, as like almost a hobby mm -hmm. to distract yourself from. And I think that's a wonderful thing. I love talking to my guest about hobbies, because I feel like a lot of times I get asked this a lot of Comic-Cons. Kids will say, like, how do you do things outside of work? Because it seems like the only way to be good at work is to do your job all the time. So do you think having hobbies is important? For kids? I think it's very important. To be honest with you, um, I'm still looking for a hobby because all of my hobbies, as you can tell, turn into jobs. But um, I think it's very important. Um, it's, it's a really big belief of mine. Um, you know, rest is just as important as work. You run yourself yeah. into the ground, you know, you can burn out. You won't be as productive or as effective as you, you know, want to or maybe even perceive yourself to be, you know. So I mm -hmm. think that... Um, I think that that's, you know, I think that re I think resting is just as important as working. And I feel like hobby is a great method of resting, so to speak. You know, you, resting doesn't necessarily mean that you're, you know, just sitting around doing nothing, but you're not focused on what you're normally focused on, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. And I think that's a, that's a good way of putting it because it is a form of rest in a way mm -hmm. for people outside of their work. I think that's a great way of putting it. Yeah. Now, and we, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, we all need a break from time to time. I know, you know, the oh, society yeah. that we grow up in isn't really big on that, but, you know, everyone needs a break. No one's a machine. Absolutely. Now, you had mentioned that you got into it sort of as a hobby and everything. Did you go to, when you were in school? Did you learn any music things when you were in school as like a elective or anything? I played saxophone in the middle school band for two years. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, I played saxophone in the middle school, and I I tried out for a jazz band, um, didn't make it. Kind of, you know, left the saxophone alone. I always told myself I was going to come back to an instrument. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm probably I'm not going back to the saxophone. I have sensitive teeth, so uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm not going back. But yeah, I, I played in uh, I played in middle school, and um, I do take lessons. Uh, I can't read music, but you know, as far as like theory and so forth, um, you know, I can I can sit in and play. I just may not be able to like write it out or explain it in its technically proficient uh, words, but I can get it done. So, do you think that it's essential for kids to do like extracurricular schooling for music, or is it more of a thing that they should learn in their own way? I would say yes to both of those. Um, and I know it's like a, a deeper um, explanation is needed, but I think music, um, I think music's cool. You know, I haven't met anyone that doesn't like music. I think, you know, finding the instrument that works for you or the path, whether it's singing or composing or that kind of thing, is more of a longer journey. But I do think music is very beneficial, um, especially when you're talking about alternatives to maybe like, mm -hmm. you know, sports or something like that. Uh, music mm -hmm. is injury free. Um, you know, music won't concuss you. But, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, and I would say as far as like, you know, what you want to, learning what you want to do, I do feel like all artists uh, or any type of artistic expression has some therapeutic, um, has some therapeutic uh, traits, um, if not being, if not the entire thing being therapeutic. So I would say that's where the, you know, learning to do it the way that you want to do it comes in. There's so many different genres, so many different instruments, um, you know, the, it's, you know, legitimately endless, what you can learn in terms of music. So I would say those are both pretty important in my mind, in terms of developing, um, just development in general. Absolutely. Now, you're one of the only guests I've had who has switched careers like this, and I love getting to talk about that because I think that's such an interesting thing because a lot of people think that once you have found a career, that's it. You can't do anything else. Mm -hmm. For you, did you find the transition of going from your previous job into this new one easy, or was there some challenges for you along the way? It was definitely difficult, and I mean, and I always say this, you know, people like Drake, Dwayne The Rock Johnson have been huge. Um, I don't know if he goes by Dwayne The Rock Johnson now or just Dwayne Johnson The Rock. I don't know. But those are like two of my heroes in terms of people who have, um, you know, garnished success in one career and, you know, realize that this isn't what they want to do for the rest of their life. And they end up being even more successful in their following career. Um, but it's, it doesn't come without its challenges, you know. I mean, it took it takes years to get to that point of being – considered successful at what you do and it's even harder to try to disassociate yourself from that as you start to move into the next career but just because things are difficult doesn't mean they're impossible and usually the harder something is the bigger the payoff on the back end I love that. I think that's a great point to bring out because I think a lot of people, once they hit like a struggle or a roadblock, it's kind of like, nope, this isn't for me, but I think that's a great way of putting it because often when it is harder, uh, the end result is always better. Yeah, it's a, it's a saying of mine, like it's not for everybody, but it's for me. So. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Now, this is something I love personally getting to talk about because I feel like there's a little bit of a mystery about producing music because we we just hear it. it's so deceptively simple for everyone because we can just go on spotify apple music you name it and we can just download it we don't have to put in any effort all we got to do is just put in some headphones put on the radio and hear it what is the process that goes into creating an album you know i don't know i'm just getting off the <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh the process for creating an album um i would say you know different people have different processes for me um, I'm a very logical, analytical type person. I'm all about, um, you know, using your time to the best of your ability, not wasting time. So in that effort, I will usually write a song um, in my home music area, uh, kind of work out the parts on the guitar, get those ideas into a uh, into my computer, 
so that I can reference them for later. I usually uh, I play a couple of other instruments too. I play the bass. I'm learning how to play a uh, piano starting next year, and I also That's amazing. Um, thank you. And I also play the drum machine, so I can pretty much put uh, do all the instruments together. Um, and once I have like you know the structure of a song, I'll start. Um, or should I say the rough draft? That's really what it is. It's a rough draft. And once I have, you know, um, enough of those to have a project, I um, send that project to the producer. We both listen to it, see things that we want to tighten up. But pretty much from then on, I would call it um, a combination of like connecting the dots um, and also like creating new dots to connect. You know, maybe there's some things in the song that may not work or, you know, making those little tweaks. After that, you go in the studio um, because the music's already there. You know, people know what they're playing. They've had a chance to listen to it, get familiar with it. I'm really big on artist expression. I play music to express myself. I want the people that play with me to be able to express themselves too. Um, so in that, my songs are usually pretty simple to play, but there's room to play whatever you feel. And I find that, you know, that makes the music, gives it, it makes it alive. Um, so after all that recording is done, then the um, producer um, usually mixes everything. And what mixing means is just adjusting the volumes of each individual instrument, where they're going to appear in terms of the sound and that kind of thing. Then things get mastered. I would consider mastering like waxing a car after it's washed, um, <laughs> putting those final touches on it, making sure it's pristine, perfect, ready to go. And then you start to talk about um, you know, release dates, things leading up to release dates. And boom, you have an album. So there you that go. That is incredible. And that's a lot of work that seems like goes into that. Yeah. But, it, you know, anything that I'm passionate about it, so it doesn't really feel like work. <laughs> now, I love talking about this specifically because you had mentioned there is a lot of people that you have to work with during this. Do you think mm -hmm. it's good to be collaborative when getting into this industry? Yes. Base answer is yes. I do think that um, it helps you be collaborative when you have more of an idea of who you are as a, you know, in, in terms of your sound and, you know, your musical taste and that kind of thing. But yeah, I think collaboration does help. It helps you look at things from a different way, um, opens you up to things you may not have even considered. And who knows, maybe you'll, you know, make friends with someone you've, already, you know, you've always been a fan of. So there's definitely a bunch of, uh, a bunch of benefits to collaborating and not just with musicians, you know, I love collaborating yeah. with, um, I love collaborating with voice actors or poets or, um, artists, you know, people who can draw, I can't do any of those things. So, um, <laughs> you know, th those are always great too, because, um, you know, creating something by yourself, you'll always be able to create stuff by yourself, but you know, it, it'll surprise you how cool the stuff that you can create with people that you're on the same page with can be. Absolutely. Now, this is a topic I love talking about because these two things kind of go hand in hand, especially within the music industry, which is competition and rejection, because a lot of times you have to be very competitive to get your work out there so people can hear it. And often when we try to put our work in front of studios and stuff, it does get rejected and that's not a good feeling. Mm -hmm. So for you, do you find competition is necessary to make it in the industry or can there be healthy competition? or you can make friends with fellow creatives. Yeah, I think I think specifically in the music industry, I think it's more of a healthy competition thing. The reality is, um, you know, no two artists are the same. Um, and if two artists are the same, like, you know, and if you are exactly like someone that's already out, I'm sorry, but uh, <laughs> that person's <laughs> already out. But, you know, I, you, I would look at music more like, um, you know, more like a huge collaborative effort. Uh, artists aren't competing with each other because there's so many people in the world, you know, so I'm, you know, I'm sure I could name a bunch of artists that you've never heard of that have like, you know, millions upon millions of fans and vice versa. I'm sure you know people and everything in between. So I do think that some people come in thinking it's a dog eat dog thing. Um, and there are different aspects of every job and career that do get pretty cutthroat and grimy. But that being said, there's enough, like, you know, there's, and I've been told this by a bunch of different people in the industry, there's enough fans to go around. It's just about, you know, being who you are consistently so that you can attract, you know, um, a fan base that's into what you're doing. Absolutely. 
Now, along with that, I always talk about rejection because whether it's putting our work in front of a music label, whether it's putting our work online, because even sometimes the way that we get reacted to on social media and when our albums are put out, the downloads, it can be a form of rejection and it mm -hmm. can be a little harsh. We don't take rejection as humans too well all the time. Right. Do you think rejection is something that kids should be taking personally or is it something they can use to learn from? Something you can use to learn from, for sure. Now, that being said, I'm an adult, and there are times that I take rejection personally. But I think that we have to remind ourselves, uh, rejection is just like rainy days. You know, rainy days suck. It's gloomy outside, but they're coming, you know. Um, rejection is kind of the same way. But just like rainy days, you know, may be bad for you. They're great for the plants. Uh, you know, they're great for the temperature, depending on where you live. Um, you know, there's, there's good things to that, too. The same way you can learn from rejection. And, um, you know, rainy days eventually pass and it makes the sunshine that much more special. The same way a failure can make, you know, a success that much more fulfilling in the end. Because failures Absolutely. do make you better. Yeah, mm -hmm. I totally agree. I think, I feel like that's something really important to talk about because especially in the day and age that we live in, social media is a huge facet to any business these days and any mm -hmm type of art. That's how we get our stuff out there. So a lot of times when we get rejection, whether it be in the form of comments and stuff, it can be a little hard to take, but it does get easier over time. Oh, I, I agree 100%. I even have a story of a uh, rejection that I had recently. I reached out to a, uh, I'm from Detroit. There's a local artist there named, um, well, I'm not going to get into names. There's a no local rapper there and I reached out to him uh, or his manager to talk about working together. Uh, he's a rapper. I haven't been producing that long. So mostly I'm known as like an, um, you know, an indie soul, electric soul artist. Um, long story short, she didn't understand the vision for what I was trying to explain and just kind of like didn't respond to me at all. Um, oh. And, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I'll say I'm familiar with rejection, especially moving into my second career. I can't tell you how many people told me from the age of 16 to even eight, from 16 to 18, you know, how stupid I was to go to LSU because those kids have been playing since they were, you know, however old or, you know, even when you get down to LSU, you know, you, you know, different types of rejection in terms of, um, you know, maybe not doing too well on the field or that kind of thing. But I, I think re rejection, I put it in the adversity bucket and you're always going to have adversity. And I think honestly, like the more adverse situations you can, you know, stay strong through and overcome, the better you'll handle the next one. Um, but it definitely Absolutely. makes you, you know, makes you better, makes you stronger, gives you an opportunity to, you know, um, you know, look at some introspective thinking too, to see what part you may have played in it. And sometimes you didn't play a part of it at all. You know, some things just don't work out, but that doesn't mean you should stop. Um, Absolutely. Because some of the great, yeah, some of the greatest success stories have rejection in them, like the Beatles, Jimi Hendrix, yeah. you know. <laughs> Now, this is a topic I love getting to talk about because while the entertainment industry has made some strides, we still have a long way to go, which is with diversity, because I feel like this is an important topic to talk about. How important do you think it is for kids to be able to look and see themselves in artists who are musicians or on the field, on TV, you name it? I think it's incredibly important, and I think that it can speak to, you know, the type, uh, the diversity levels of whatever different sport or avenue that we're talking about right now. You know, being African-American growing up in the inner city, basketball is always around. I feel like that's why there are so many African-American basketball players. Um, but I do think that it's very important for kids, and I also, you know, as an adult, I think it's important to see people that look like you. You know, the two people I mentioned earlier, I mean, I know I don't look exactly like Drake or Dwayne The Rock Johnson or anything like that, but those are people of, you know, color, um, you know, who are doing great things, and that honestly motivates me even as an adult. Um, but even when, you know, you get to talking about, like, uh, diversity, race and so forth. I know people like to throw around terms like black and white and that kind of thing, but I'm much more of a, you know, we're all human beings. We all come from somewhere. Um, you know, like my ancestors aren't from black continent, you know, and so forth. So um, when it comes to diversity, I'm also really big on trying to, you know, learn more about each other um, as opposed to someone being white, like maybe they're Italian or from the Netherlands or, you know, that kind of thing. 
um, because I think that those things also help with diversity. You know, the more we learn about each other, the more, you know, as human beings, the more we learn about anything, the more open we are to it. And I think, you know, that that's um, that falls into that category, too. You know, the more we learn about it, the more comfortable we get talking to each other um, about those kind of things, the better it'll be. Yeah, that is a great point to bring up. I haven't really had anybody say that yet. I think that oh, learning about one another. No, that's a great well, thing. I love that because that is such a valid point because a lot of times we keep everything in a box of just mm -hmm. – they, this is how we look at a person, but until we learn more about them, we don't really know anything. So I think that's a great point to bring up, and I hope you kiddos learn from that because I think that's a great thing that we can talk about is learning about one another because it also builds more compassion for one another, I feel. Absolutely, absolutely. When you can understand someone, or at least begin to understand someone, you can start to maybe make an effort to put yourself in their shoes, you know, um, and I think that like you said, that compassion is definitely going to go a long way in the long run because I don't know, man, like when dogs see each other, if there's a German Shepherd and a miniature Schnauzer that were in the streets right now, you know, they wouldn't not associate with each other because they look different, you know, in their mind, yeah. like we're both dogs, you know, that kind of thing. I don't, I just, I hope one day we can get to that point as human beings. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that because I feel like that's something super important. Now, this is a fun topic I love getting to talk about because everyone thinks once you reach like a certain point in your career, that's it. You can't go anywhere else. But artists are always constantly dreaming, always wanting to do different things, try different things. So is there anyone that you haven't worked with yet or any project you haven't gotten to do yet that you'd like to? Oh, absolutely. I mean, in terms of my career, I would say I'm in the infancy of it. Um, I'm going to say it again. Drake and Dwayne Johnson. I would love to do anything with those people. Uh, if but as anybody far as artists, watching this is in contact with either one of them, you know where please, to send them now. <laughs> please. <laughs> but um, I would say uh, Kanye West, you know, um, Kid Cudi, especially being guys from the Midwest, um, I can tell that we see thing, a lot of things the same way, and I think we can make really good music together. Um, outside of the, I mean, and a, a bunch of other different rap artists. Um, outside of that genre, I would say bands like MGMT, The Killers, The Strokes, Alabama Shakes, if they're still together, I don't know. Um, the Marcus King Band. Um, you know, there's a, there's, there's a bunch of local artists in Austin I would love to work with. Sheridan Reeves, one that comes to mind. Uh, AB The Nomad. Um, I would say overseas, people who really stand out are like Adele, Sam Smith, the Arctic Monkeys. Uh, you know, I mean, and I know we talked about this before uh, the, the show started, like even, I mean, Jean Boyega, anyone that's been affiliated with anything that I'm a fan of. So anyone that's done anything Star Wars related, any, any you know, Tommy Oliver, the Green Ranger, or, well, not the Green Ranger. I, I know he has a name. It's, it's Jason David Frank. Jason David Frank. Um, I mean, I, I'm i very creative. I could work with a bunch of people. I'd love to work with any of my heroes. That is awesome. And John Boyega is super cool. So I don't blame you at all for that one. John, if you're watching this, no. <laughs> John, if you end up seeing this somehow, <laughs> you have now a new person you can work with. No, that's actually right? one of my goals. I feel like I'll run into him one day. One of my, one of my, big goals in terms of music is to like sell out Wembley Stadium in London. So I plan on being out there a lot. That is amazing. I hope I am going to just hope for the rest of the time until it happens that it happens because that has to happen now. I just want to make it. We're going to put it out there during It'll this happen. episode that that's going to happen eventually. Yeah, maybe you could uh, design the guitar. I love, I, I actually used to play guitar. So that I've always wanted to design one of those. So that would be a dream. <laughs> <laughs> for sure now well, a few more cool. questions for you these okay. ones are some of my favorites i get to talk about because i feel like these ones kind of dig a little deeper than most okay. is there any projects that you you mentioned earlier that you released a cd back in march is mm -hmm. there any projects that you're currently working on or do you want to talk a little bit about that and tell us about them um i actually just released a project called uh sincerely a couple weeks ago um and i'm dropping another project at the end of the year called um 808's love and soul um so that'll be cool it's uh i'm pretty much getting into this tribute type series where i'll 
you know, pick an artist who influenced me, do a couple covers of their songs, and then like four or five of my originals that uh, were directly influenced by that artist. So this year it'll be Teddy Pendergrass. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited about that. And then next year I know I have a bunch of projects coming out. Um, one that's top of mind right now, and it'll probably be like the first big one that I release next year is a Star Wars project. Um, I'm working with Kevin Cabral, also known as uh, Funk Lord Vader on social media channels. Um, and I think it's going to be really special. And I think it's going to be, um, you know, the beginning of a series because this one was a lot of fun and I'm sure we're going to make at least one more. So That is super cool. I cannot wait to hear those and see those come out. And I will link you guys to the ones that are down below so you guys can go and check the ones that are already out and then be able to keep track of the other ones as well. So last question, my favorite one I get to ask because I feel like this is going to just encapsulate it bring it all back around. If there's a kid out there right now, a young adult, or even an adult who wants to get into music, whether it be just beginning in their career or later in their career, what is the one thing you feel like they should walk away from watching this learning? You need to value honesty. Um, I think we all get to a certain point, especially as artists, where you think everything you do is great um but i think that you need to value other people's opinions because that's what's going to get you ultimately where you want to go i'm not saying take other people's opinions you know as you know the gospel but you know you need to have people around you that will tell you the truth about whatever you need the truth you know and i know this has probably nothing to do with you know uh, music specifically but that's i think that's a very 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 undervalued life skill you know looking for the truth because that's what's going to get you better. Absolutely. I think that that's a great lesson. I haven't really had anybody say something like that. So that's a great thing. I think that can be applied in pretty much any industry. And that's something that's sorely missing nowadays. So for thank sure. you very, very much for sharing that. I hope you kiddos out there learned a lot from this episode, because I know I certainly did. And now comes my favorite part of the show, where I get to show you what I was making over here while we were chatting. I'm oh, going to cool. warn you ahead of time that the lights do sometimes mess this up a little bit. They kind of reflect and everything. So I'll, I'll make sure that the actual copy of it's sent over to you. I'll just put my mask on so you can't see my facial reaction. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try. I'm going to try to get this Oh, that there. is super cool. Yay! You oh, see, wow. I, I noticed, I was like, there goes the light again. This, see, this is the problem. You have to have the studio lights and they always kind of mess with the computer colors. And I'm like... Oh, well, you know but what? that's the good thing about technology is that we can send it to each other. <laughs> that's true. Tell that to the kids, too. You know, the yeah. light, that's another thing people in the entertainment industry need to know. Lighting? No, I'm just, I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> lighting is very good. <laughs> yeah, lighting is like, I didn't realize how important lighting was. But yes, I don't know. Lighting is everything. You know? It is. It, it really is. It's surprising. Well, yeah. thank you so much for coming on. And thank you again to everyone who tuned in. Again, I am your host and in-house artist, Aaron Leffler. Catch you next time on The Drawing Board. I don't have one of those clickers yet, so I'm like, you know what? This is where I'm cutting it. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> My hands work perfectly fine. For sure. <laughs>